OCO, hello, I'm Jen Deerenwater, the founding executive director of Crushing Colonialism, and I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Crushing Colonialism is committed to the full inclusion of our community members. For our blind attendees, each speaker will give a description of what we look like and what is around us, and then we'll get started with our conversations. I'll begin by describing myself. So I am a light, complected native two-spirit woman. I have brown hair that's pulled back. I'm wearing black um, nerdy glasses. I have on multicolored bright beaded earrings and a blue shirt and uh, a bright red lipstick. So on with the show now. So Crushing Colonialism's mission is to uplift and tell the stories of indigenous people through multimedia work while supporting those doing the work. Our organization is founded and operated by indigenous people working in a variety of media fields across the world. We work to increase the pay and employment of indigenous media makers while also promoting their work, providing funding for media projects and increasing access to professional representation. In doing this, we control our narratives in order to crush colonialism. I'm especially delighted to bring the three R's, realize, recognize, and reconciliation to the world. This five-day virtual event series covers reproductive justice issues indigenous people across the so-called Americas are facing. Every day covers a related topic with diverse indigenous people speaking their truths. The three R's has been a labor of love organized in partnership with Joy Braun, Lorraine Clements, and Valerie Proctor. We've had to change this event over time due to COVID-19 pandemic and a lack of resources. Unfortunately, along the way, we lost Métis elder Velma Orvis, who was originally scheduled as a speaker. In many ways, the struggles we've encountered organizing this event are tied to the genocide indigenous people are still suffering. So we're focusing on reproductive justice issues as these are directly tied to genocide. The organization Sister Song defines reproductive justice as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. The three R's is generously sponsored by the LGBTQ Task Force, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, DC Diverse City Fund, the Campaign for Southern Equality, the Washington Office on Latin America, the Civil Liberties and Public Policy Conference and Program at Amherst College, and the North American Indian Center of Boston. I'm excited to introduce my co-presenter, Saitami Duchisela. Duchisela. Saitami is a two-spirit trans man descendant of the Puruja Inca, people of Ecuador, and is of mixed Panamanian heritage. They are a provider of holistic health support, primarily to queer, trans, bisexual, indigenous people of color via social media platforms. A multidisciplinary and artist versed in various forms of dance, music, acting, visual arts, creative writing, choreography, and performance art. They center their art around the healing needs of the collective through insight from their own healing experiences. A stage manager in the Washington DC area, primarily for theater of, for young audiences. They hold a bachelor's in business and entertainment specialized in multiply, multidisciplinary arts and management from American University. They've co-founded and formerly directed several local arts organizations, such as the Artist Solidarity Foundation and the Nailwat Ishkamewe Artist Collective. We recognize that the education most non-Indigenous people have received doesn't include a full and accurate history of Indigenous people. The educational system also ignores the current conditions and lives of Indigenous people. Today's presentation serves as a primer for the following three R's events and for the future in general. Sai, would you like to get started and give us a visual description of yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be able to be here. And I welcome everybody in this space. 
I am a fairly light skinned indigenous person wearing a orange and blue pashmina around my neck and a black um, sweater. And I have short black hair. And um, yeah, that's, that's all. <laughs> And that's as much as I can say about my description. <laughs> All right, should we get the slides up? Sure. Good, everyone can see? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, well, welcome to Native 101. We're gonna do our best to give you this introductory class on what it means, on who are the indigenous people. So we have some guidelines for you as an audience member um, because of past experiences that we've had as indigenous people, it's important to us to have you be aware that um, of, of what we're gonna, of, what these guidelines are. <laughs> Indigenous people have been stripped of every component of their identity at some point in history and have had to reconstruct their essence and rights with the few remaining pieces with much sacrifice over the passing of generations during hundreds of years in order to reestablish their sovereignty. We ask that you be mindful of the ancestral journey that is brought forth in the preparation of this presentation and to work to release any inclination towards the further exploitation, exoticization, or appropriation of indigenous knowledge, culture, history, and plight that you may learn about here and elsewhere. So in the continent known as America, we have what is what has been referred as three nations, the Eagle Nation, the Quetzal Nation, and the Condor Nation, each referring to every part of the American continent. The northern, continent, the northern part being the Eagle Nation, Central America being the Quetzal Nation, and South America being the Condor Nation. In the Eagle Nation, um, this, this nation is comprised by the so-called USA and Canada, and it is self-denominated as the Eagle Nation because of its dominating bird spirit of the Eagle. The Quetzal Nation is comprised is comprised by the lands known as Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. And it is because of the dominating bird spirit of the Quetzal. And in the Condor Nation, it is comprised by Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, Uruguay, Paraguay, Argentina, Brazil, Guyana, Suriname, and French Guiana. And it is named this way because of the dominating bird spirit of the condor. So here's a general pan indigenous overview, a general overview that talks about things that all of the American indigenous people um, experience. So we have, we have uh, certain titles and names that have been used to describe us. We have a lot of diverse things that make us diverse and a lot of things that make us very similar. And there are things that make us in the American continent different from the rest of the indigenous people in the rest of the world. So the cross-continental homogeneous identifications that exist for us are First Nations, Native American, American Indian, Indigenous, 
indígenas, which is actually the Spanish word for indigenous. Indios, it's the Spanish word for Indian. And mestizos, which can be translated to mixed. Our diversities and similarities. There are indigenous populations all across Northern, Central, and Southern America. Altogether, there are over 1,362 indigenous nations. Altogether, across the continent, there are over 941 indigenous dialects and languages. Each nation has their respective cultural practice and belief. There is prominent overlapping of DNA, of culture, and imposed consequences from colonization. The distinction between indigenous people here and those outside of America are we have prevalent and deeply rooted consequences of European colonization that have gone unaddressed. There is um, heavily marginalized and minoritized indigenous populations. There is systematic and cultural erasure of indigenous traditions, language, and identity. And we have politically endorsed land and human labor exploitation as a default means uh, for economic gains. All right, this is Jen. I'm going to take it from here. So our next slide here is general causes, effects of, and responses to colonization. So what we mean by causes is, um, for example, who our colonizers were and are. Um, the United States is still young in terms of being a nation, but before that we were colonized by a lot of different European nations. This included the English, the Spanish, Portuguese, French, Dutch, and Swedish. And when they came, they brought pillagery, genocide, rape, separation from family and sovereign land, criminalization of traditions and ceremonies, cultural stigmas, foreign diseases, imbalanced relationship with nature herself. Some of the general effects of this are loss of identity, culture, history, traditions, and community, decline in physical and mental health, and further removal of sovereign living and direct connection to the land itself. Existence is a form of resistance, but it's directly targeted by systematic oppression. Now, responses, the indigenous response to this can be things such as land rights, sovereignty, accessibility, honoring treaties, respect of culture, proper recertification of the retelling, uh, excuse me, proper rectification of the retelling of history uplifting of identity and communities, accountability and reconnection with land. An example of this cause effect and response is the theft of land for resource extractions. An, out, an effect of that cause is, for example, in the four corners where uranium is mined, the rates of ovarian and testicular cancer for native people there are 15 times the national average. Native women on the Pine Ridge Reservation have miscarriages at six times the national average. Man camps, which are makeshift living quarters for workers who are overwhelmingly non-native and from outside the area are set up when resource extraction projects are come through our lands. Partially as a result of this, murder is the, thir the third leading cause of death for native women and on some reservations, Native women are murdered at 10 times the US average. Also, we're a very youth heavy population. 42% of the Native population is made up of people age 24 or younger, whereas the general US population, those age 24 and younger, make up 34%. And this, this is an outcome, this is an effect of the genocide that we are suffering. So examples, modern day examples of an indigenous response to this 
are resistance camps at construction sites of unwanted projects like the Keystone XL or Dakota Access Pipeline. It's also the land back movement in which colonizers give the land back to native people. And so identity, let's talk a bit about that. So defining our identity, um, indigenous people are often having to fight just to be seen and this can be reflected in our identities, how we identify ourselves versus how others identify us. As a totally sovereign people, the indigenous people of America went by their respective tribal names. The word indigenous means original to a place, hence the only reason it is used is to identify indigenous people as the other from the rest of this continent's inhabitants due to the colonization and globalization of America. It was also created to homogeneize the people and manufacture them as a race to assimilate them into systematically racist governments and more calculatedly exploit the natural, natural resources from the lands, therefore taking indigenous people out of the equation. It is important to recognize that there are thousands of indigenous tribes across the continent who each hold their respective name identification. Sai, it's back to you. <laughs> this is Sai again. <laughs> so a big component um, for us indigenous people is our relationship with sovereignty. The meaning of the word sovereignty is the authority to govern yourself, according to our dictionary. Um, across America, Indigenous people struggle with achieving sovereignty in different ways. It is systematically embedded to maintain possession over the culture, lands, identities, and even bodies of people indigenous to this continent. Sovereignty is a right to freedom and access to resources that was stripped away through colonization that forcibly removed indigenous people from having practically any rights whatsoever. Only gradually and in an extremely slow and sacrificing process have indigenous people recovered certain rights, starting with the right to live. Now let's talk a little bit about migration versus immigration. So these two words are one uh, are two different are two different words used to describe essentially the same thing. Um, migration itself has been part of indigenous history since before colonization. It's the way many of today's nations became who they are, and much of the reason behind our many similarities as indigenous people. But the concept of immigration doesn't apply in the modern day movement of folks with indigenous heritage because it's defined as the movement from one country to a foreign one. Um, however, for indigenous people that are, that, are <laughs> that are indigenous to this continent, wherever they might move on this continent is still going to be their native country and can never be their foreign country. Back to you, Jen. Great, excellent. So indigenous in North America, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that experience. So I wanna start just by telling you how many of us there are. So pre-white invasion, there were estimates from anywhere that there were 112 million to 8 million native people on, um, on this land. Um, the, the estimates vary pretty widely, obviously. Um, but the one thing we do know is that after the invasion, by 1650, the population had declined to less than 6 million people. Um, now, the 2010 census uh, says that Native people make up a little less than 2% of the total American population. 
Now these numbers though are pre-COVID and as we've lost many people due to the government's unwillingness to meet its trust and treaty responsibilities, these numbers could be lower now. However, as the 2020 census was rife with racism, other underfunding and other institutional oppressions, coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic and a lack of wireless technology on many tribal lands. I know we will be grossly underreported in the 2020 numbers. So we're gonna speak a bit more about native identities. <clears throat> My apologies, give me a moment. There we go, okay, so native identities. So indigenous identity, it's how we define ourselves. Indigenous self-identity can differ from how the colonizer defines us. Federal and state recognition. Federal and state recognition is a system rooted in colonization, which the federal and state governments decide who is a real tribe and who gets to be sovereign. Blood quantum. Blood quantum is the amount of, quote, Indian blood that an individual possesses. And there's tribal enrollment. Enrollment is the act of recognition of tribal members by a tribal nation. Tribes set their own rules regarding tribal enrollment and membership. I'm going to speak just a bit more on those, each of those, but I wanted to read the slide for you first. So indigenous identity, I'll use myself as an example. When I am speaking about myself, I say that I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Now to a non-native, they might call me an American Indian. I don't like that. That's not how I identify. You know, I also identify by my ancestral lands versus the lands that my people were removed to on the Trail of Tears. So I also identify in that way. I have ties to two different lands. Some indigenous people will also uh, identify themselves by their clans, uh, by tribal villages, rancherias. It, it can vary a great deal. And so going a bit more into the recognition process. So a federally recognized tribe is a native tribal entity that is recognized as having a government to government relationship with the United States with the responsibilities, powers, limitations, and obligations attached to that designation and is eligible for funding and services from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Federally recognized tribes are recognized as possessing certain inherent rights of self-government. This is referred to as tribal sovereignty. And we are entitled to receive certain federal benefits, services, and protections because of the special relationship with the United States. At present, there are 574 federally recognized American Indian and Alaskan Native tribes and villages. I could not find a set number that I felt comfortable with uh, for state recognized tribes. Um, state recognition is another colonized government process of being recognized. However, it does not come with all of the same um, benefits, I guess I will say, as being a federally recognized tribe. Uh, I think it's important that we recognize that there are many indigenous tribal nations that are absolutely valid but that are not being seen as sovereign entities, such as our native Hawaiian relatives. So blood quantum. So as I said before, blood quantum is the amount of Indian blood that an individual possesses, you know, quote, Indian blood. However, I want you all to understand that blood quantum is not only not traditional, but it's also been used as an act of genocide against us. You know, it's based on documents collected by white men that were often inaccurate. Um, and it serves as a way to get rid of native people. Similar to the way the one drop rule was used to create more enslaved people, blood quantum was used to erase the validity of native people. This is also part of why we have such high rates of sexual assault as rape is a tool of genocide. And I want to end on the blood quantum with one final note. 
that the only living beings in the United States that have to register their blood quantum with the government are dogs, horses, and native people. So tribal enrollment, as I said, enrollment is the act of recognition of tribal members by a tribal nation and tribes set their own rules regarding tribal enrollment as they are sovereign nations. So for me, when I say that I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, it means that I am a citizen and I have all of the full rights. I vote in my government's elections, all of that. However, I also recognize that the enrollment process and the tribal recognition process is inherently flawed as it is an act of colonization. So I still recognize the relatives who may not be in recognized tribes or have enrollment. So <clears throat> we're gonna move on to our relationship with the land. <clears throat> so where we live and why. So indigenous people have been removed from our lands many times over the 500 years of colonization. And our ancestral lands may not be where we reside due to these removals. We also may not reside on the reservations that we have been moved to as 71% of native people live in urban areas now, partially as a result of the 1950s termination era, which was meant to terminate the sovereign states of tribes. It was meant to um, terminate the government to government relationship with the United States government. And it was also meant to further hurt us culturally in the United States relocated a lot of native people to urban areas. So we've been moved a great deal. We've often been moved to suit the current political and economic needs of the white man as they steal our resources. And so just to tell you a little bit about these resources and what we have on our lands. So in terms of recognized indigenous lands, they contain 302 forested reservations, 17.9 million acres of native forest lands, 7.7 .7 million acres of timberland, 10.2 million acres of woodland. We have 260 miles of interna international borders with Mexico in a distance of 100 miles longer than California's border with Mexico. Native lands also comprise one fourth of the US's total onshore oil and gas but less than 5% of the potential energy production has been extracted from these lands. That's really important, important to point out as we have been moved around so much so that railroads could be built or you know, trees could be cut down or pipelines can go in the ground. And it, it's very scary to know that we comprise a fourth of the US's onshore oil and gas, but less than 5% of it has been extracted. Um, so trust and treaties. The US federal government has signed many, has many trust and treaty responsibilities to tribal nations. However, the US has broken every single treaty they ever signed with us. Um, it's also important to point out that before the United States was formed as a nation, tribal nations east of the Mississippi River signed our own uh, treaties with whoever the colonizing nation was of the time, the British, the French, and whenever a new nation took over those lands, that treaty was supposed to go with them. Well, the United States never honored any of those treaties nor have they honored any that they directly signed with us. Um, so when you hear us talk about trust and treaty responsibilities, we take that very seriously. You know, we signed those as an act of good faith with the colonizers um, and they have certain rights and so do we. And unfortunately they're not being honored. So migration. Due to a lack of resources, forced removals, and the pre-colonization movement of our ancestors, we have often migrated across many lands, as I have touched on. Um, this impacts our identity, and it, it does it in a, a number of ways. So our identities have shifted with time uh, because we've blended with other tribal nations, um, perhaps as a survival strategy. Um, it's because we have become mixed race. Um, 
it's not uncommon to meet Native people now who are of several nations as well as other ethnic groups. This is also, we've had a process of assimilation. Assimilation is a tool uh, that the colonizer uses. And the idea is to basically kill the Indian and save the man. It's to get rid of our indigeneity. So with that, I'll let Sai take it back over. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, let me share a little bit about um, the indigenous people in Latin America. By the way, here we see um, an indigenous person in um, probably Bolivia uh, handing somebody a leaf of the plant coca which has actually been widely used in Bolivia specifically for those who worked in, um, in mines uh, for silver and salt, I believe. And um, the, the climate there is very cold, um, but also it be very strenuous, very exploitative work. Um, so, the coca leaves would help or do help um, in keeping physical stamina up. Um, and that's also how it's related to Coca-Cola <laughs> and this like high energy intake. But um, also on the leaf of coca, it's uh, very much a part of indigenous culture and it's not necessarily used every time for every strenuous activity. It's, it's become more embedded in the culture. Okay, speaking on Latin American native identities. So in Latin America, there is um, a lot of diversity when it comes to indigenous um, people because of the various ecosystems that exist down there. We have um, in Ecuador alone, all, um, every kind of ecosystem that you can find. Um, so one example of, of the diversity that we have there are the people, the Andean people from, from the highlands where uh, be it in Peru or Ecuador, um, and then um, uh, indigenous people from um, the Amazon, um, where uh, be it also in Ecuador or <laughs> in Brazil. Then we, um, so, so yes. <laughs> in terms of indigenous identity, in Latin America, there is a big um, culture of this mixed race idea. Um, there has been a lot of um, cross-ethnic um, system, a lot of assimilation through, through creating new mixed races. Um, and in Spanish, that is called uh, mestizaje. Um, and it is it has become so common and so so dispersed that that it's become the prominent identity over over the identities of indigenous identities or even um, colonial identities. Um, there are a lot of people who still very much take pride in their culture, who still very much, uh, even entire countries who have a lot of, um, who do uh, have a lot of cultural representation and celebration of indigenous heritage. However, the majority of the population is under this kind of um, um, blurred, blurred identity of, um, of unknown, unknown identity um, and um, which can, which 
which leads to a lot of um, unidentified indigenous people in Latin America, as well as those who have migrated to North America. So we have a lot of, let's say, brown people from Latin America who won't identify as indigenous um, no matter how much um, indigenous descendants they might have because of this um, this um, kind of phenomenon of uh, mestizaje and um, this um, pressure to conform to non-indigenous heritage. Um, yeah, and um, one one way that that can be seen actually uh, in North America is um, through the U.S. Census, um, many Latin American migrants of indigenous descendants um, find themselves actually or have found themselves checking the box of white on the U.S. Census. Um, losing their own identity um, altogether once they've migrated um, to the U.S. or to North America, but um, it having already been lost <clears throat> with uh, generations, uh, from generations before. So um, even if, even if a person has um, a very indigenous uh, or a, a um, grandparents who are still very in touch with their indigenous culture, they still um, won't necessarily identify as indigenous. Um, yeah, because of, at the end of the day, because of that pressure. Um, then um, you can relate one of those reasons is because uh, indigenous people are, uh, make up 43% of the, of the, um, poverty population in Latin America. So there is a, there are extremely low uh, resources um, that are accessible to indigenous people in Latin America, which makes identifying as indigenous all that less attractive. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, yeah, <laughs> extreme poverty. So in terms of um, our relationship to, to the land, um, of course, we've also had a lot of migration since before colonial times. Um, but because of extreme poverty, a lot of indigenous people have been forced to migrate to big cities, leaving their, um, their native lands uh, and a lot of native lands be becoming reduced to only like the, the senior citizen people. Um, and of course, that leads to losing cultural heritage, languages, traditions, et cetera, identification altogether. Um, this um, force, um, forceful displacement um, has led to migration to other countries, to other continents. You can find indigenous Latin American people, um, even with very strong connections to their heritage in every part of the world. Um, something that is very prominent in Latin America when it comes to indigenous people is racism and classism. Um, something that I've found personally uh, is that um, it isn't very widely known that in Latin America there are there are non-indigenous people. So there are a lot of people that aren't brown. Um, in fact, they are the most visible people if you travel to Latin America, uh, the non non-indigenous people. Um, there are a lot of white Latin American people, and um, the the colonial heritage has really, has also really prevailed in Latin America. So that, that has led to a lot of classism that still exists. Um, um, and 
and racism. So, yep, classism and racism. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I can speak on that in my in my personal experience. Um, having gone to high school in Ecuador and being one of very few um, brown skinned people and um, having that be the um, uh, that trait that that young people uh, that that was kind of like my thing um, the way that everybody has a thing in, you know, in high school, there's, there's a thing that everybody has. And my thing was that I was native. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and that is, um, that is even just, uh, beyond or, you know, uh, that is, only because I was aware of my indigenous heritage and understanding that there is there was there existed that assimilation existed and this awareness of that, because there were still a lot of other brown people in the school, um, who who just didn't identify as indigenous. Um, they probably didn't identify as anything at all because racism does look a lot different here. Uh, in Latin America than it does here. Okay, so when it comes to governmental recognition or federal recognition, there isn't an idea of sovereignty. There isn't a recognition that um, indigenous nations um, deserve to self-govern or have authority over their lands. But there are, um, there is involvement with the government that um, allows them to still live on their land. So a lot of um, indigenous people live on their original lands. Um, they will have very low access to resources um, and, uh, and a variety of them. And, um, and there is also a convoluted definition as to um, what an indigenous person is. So whether or not then um, that that means, sorry. So um, there is a blurred line when it comes to identifying as an, an, an indigenous person um, because of um, relating that person either directly to to living on the the native land or not. Let me try to rephrase that. <laughs> so basically, um, there is a discord because there's an attempt to define indigenous people as people who don't live in um, urban environments. Um, and those indigenous people who are living in urban environments. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, okay. I think you got it, ish. Okay. <laughs> um, also, I'd like to explain this image a little bit. We have um, elder uh, indigenous women in this photo. They are protesting, they are organizing, they're coming together. Um, to to raise awareness about um, environmental conservation and um, the proper usage and proper relationship with the land. So um, one of the women is holding up a sign that says, um, I'll read it in Spanish first. Unidos en la defensa de nuestros mares, lagunas y tierras, los ikuts vinisa. And in English, what that says is united in the de defense of our seas, lagoons, and lands, the Ikut Spinisa. Okay. So, um, Sai, Sai, let's take a one minute break here. 
All right, so we're going to take just a one minute break. This is a way to give our captioners interpreters a rest starting now. All right, a minute is up. So, Sa, you want to continue on? Well, we've discussed a lot about the plight of Indigenous people. <laughs> As you can tell, it's been a hard, it's been a hard journey. Um, but um, there are a lot of good things that. Um, Indigenous people have carried out through all of this. Um, of course, um, we could have probably done better without. <laughs> but um, these are the more positive consequences um, or just the things that we've had to figure out along the way. Um, one of those things was, is, and probably will always be that indigenous people are at the forefront of environmental protection and conservation and making sure that we have a balanced relationship with um, all of the resources on this planet. <laughs> um, we very, um, we surprisingly still have a good connection with our ancestral traditions our medicines, our understandings about life and the ways of the world, which does a lot for the rest of civilization um, because they're very integrated with this balanced relationship with between humans and the rest of and the, the world slash universe. <laughs> and then um, the third topic that I'll touch on for now is our resilience. So that is just our ability to continue with our goals and continue striving for the betterment of our individual lives, as well as our collective lives, as well as the betterment of our relatives in other nations. And that is something that we are very much an example of to the rest of the world. And many times we show leadership um, through having endured so much and and still coming up on the other side and doing that through representation through through thriving in whatever fields um in whatever fields All right, so this is Jen. I'm gonna speak a bit now about leadership, representation, and resistance through existence. So leadership, um, often we natives are portrayed as being, you know, mentally incompetent or childlike, but that is simply not true. You know, we are leaders within our communities, our governments. 
within the US and state governments and non-native entities such as nonprofits and corporations. You know, um, we have war societies that still exist. We have traditional and ceremonial leaders. Indigenous people are leaders and we're doing it in a multitude of ways. And that's incredibly important that it's understood that we are perfectly capable of governing ourselves and being out there and giving back to the world. Um, so the, the next one I wanna talk about is representation. I think this is super important as there was a study done recently, it's called the, Re the Reclaiming Native Truth, a project to dispel America's myths and misconceptions. So in this study, they found that only 34% of people in the US believe that indigenous people face discrimination. And that is laughable to me that only 34% believe we face discrimination when we have such a, a horrid history under colonization and with the things that are still occurring. But we're fighting back. We've always been fighting back and we're seeing changes. We're seeing you know, sports mascots going away and instead, you know, indigenous people acting on the big screen, winning Oscars for movies. Um, the three R's in itself is another form of representation. Every day of this event, we have different indigenous people from across the Americas. You know, we have people who identify as disabled, chronically ill, um, as queer, bisexual, I myself and by and two spirit, you know, we have all kinds of people coming together and talking about the vastness and the beauty of indigeneity. So this is another form of representation. So we are always out there. Um, we just need to have the barriers knocked down so that we can be seen more by non-native, non-indigenous society. So resistance through existence, you know, simply existing becomes an act of resistance when those in power and often also the people in our daily lives believe that our lives have no value. You know, when you live under things like kill the Indian, save the man, or you're called savages, or for example, the Declaration of Independence calls us merciless Indian savages, you know, getting up every day and just continuing on becomes an act of resistance. Um, you know, and when you look at everything that indigenous people have been through, you know, we've been murdered almost to the point of complete extinction and have suffered horrors that are beyond comprehension, but we're still here and we're still fighting and we're doing amazing things every day. So that, that is resistance through existence. And it also speaks to resiliency, which Sai had spoke on. Sai, you wanna tell us a little bit about your homelands? I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> so personally, I was born in Honduras because my father was working out there at the time. But my father is from Ecuador and my mother is from Panama. And I lived my um, high school years in Quito, the capital of Ecuador. And that was made possible because my father was so adamant about us staying connected to our indigenous culture and heritage. My father at a very early age was sent to a boarding school in Wisconsin actually, um, because that was the best form of education um, that he could have at the same time, um, the cheapest education that he could have. Um, and um, since that age, he had the opportunity to never go back to Latin America, but, um, um, you know, I'm, I have to admire my, my, you know, give, give a lot of kudos to my dad for that because of, uh, give a, a lot of kudos to my dad because he stuck with, with what his father and his grandfather, um, embedded in him, which was that we should always stay connected to our indigenous identity. Um, 
So that is what he did to the best of his abilities with his four children, me being the fourth. Um, and and um, one way that he did that was by taking um, his four children away from the capital of Ecuador, which is where we lived, and went to the school to our native lands that we are connected with that my father reconnected to at the age of 18, around there. When he went back to Ecuador to study college because of the sole reason of wanting to reconnect to Ecuador. And he was somewhere else, I can't remember, he traveled a lot. <laughs> um, so. So we would go back to our native lands um, every other weekend where my parents built a house. Um, and we were so fortunate in that respect to be able to do that. Um, whereas a lot of, like I said before, a lot of people with indigenous heritage aren't even aware that they have that heritage or and don't identify as such. But we were able to visit our community at any given time and learn about it, um, even if it meant going there and uh, actually just taking lessons, you know, asking to um, someone from the community to give us lessons in uh, weaving, uh, in weaving, <laughs> um, or, or in the language of Quechua. Um, which was very basic and was a very long time ago. So I, I can't say I speak it, <laughs> but I'm still very young and do have plans to take Kichwa, at least. Um, and one other thing that I can share about it is that um, my great grandfather was the person who migrated from that village to the outside world, let's say. Um, he, he was the son of um, two of some, okay, so his parents were property owners there in, in, in our land, or not property owners, but they had their, their land. <laughs> that is a very colonial way of, of putting it. <laughs> but they had their lands, they grew, they, they grew their crops, and um, when my great-grandfather was a, a, a young adult, he decided to travel into the city and create a whole new life for himself. And he didn't just stop at the next major city. He ended up, I don't know what bit him, but he ended up traveling to Europe in the, I don't even know what century it was, but it, it was like in the previous century or I guess two centuries ago now, but, <laughs> um, and he, yeah, so he was just a very kind of ambitious person and, and the type of native I strive to be <laughs> because he didn't let anything stop him. And um, still he said, he, you know, he made sure his children and his grandchildren knew that we needed to stay connected and I just try to honor that every day. Great. Thank you, Sai. So this is Jen speaking again. So we have a few questions here. Um, so Jen and Alina asked a similar question. Um, so, oops, I'm sorry. Ellen and Jen asked a similar question. My apologies. Alina, we will get to your question in a minute. Um, so can we talk about the difference between native and indigenous and, and indigenous as a term of identity um, are both okay to use? Is it a matter of, matter of personal preference? Um, and then following that from Jen is, should the word tribes be avoided by non-natives or is it a word that more depends on how or where it's used? Um, I'll give my response and then Sai can, can give theirs. Um, so if I'm speaking directly about me and my nation, I'll say Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. If I'm speaking about 
the Lakota, and we'll say, I'm speaking specifically about the Pine Ridge Reservation, you know, there are those times where you do name name the tribe or the land, the land that they're in, the res, the village, what have you. However, native and indigenous are kind of, we just pan into indigenous terms. They're a way of talking about all of us as a group. Um, personally, I'm fine being called native and I'm fine with indigenous. I don't like being called native American or American Indian. Um, it's a little complicated for me because I'm I'm mixed race. Uh, I'm white and Cherokee, so I recognize that some of my relatives did come over here and invade these lands and 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 take them. Um, but not all of my ancestors chose to be American. You know, some of my ancestors are older than America. You know, we've been here since time immemorial. So I just personally don't like being called American. Um, and I don't like being called Indian because it's it's a pretty derogatory term and it's not accurate at all. You know, my people are not from India. That's that's not my lands. That's not my culture. Don't call me an Indian. Um, now, if you talk to another native, they might give you a different answer. I mean, that's the thing where we're not all the same. We're 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 vast and we're different. But I think um, just for good practice, if you're non-native, if you're speaking about, you know, a specific tribe, say that tribe's name. If you're speaking about a specific part of land, say that land. Um, if you're asking a general question, like, you know, what is, you know, what are the statistics for houselessness amongst native people? The words native or indigenous are fine. Um, I feel like the word native tends to get a little bit used more in the US and Canada, whereas indigenous feels broader. You know, there are indigenous people everywhere. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd say. Um, there's nothing wrong with saying the word tribes. I personally like to say tribal nation uh, to help hammer home the point that we're not just a small group of people, we are a nation of people with our own, you know, practices of self-governance, you know, our own languages, our traditions. Um, so personally, that's what I like to say. Um, Sai, would you like to, to weigh in on this? I agree. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> I know we have more questions, so that's pretty much the gist. Okay. <laughs> Um, so we have another question here. This is from Alina. So what resources do you recommend to learn about indigenous populations that previously inhabited the land we're currently living on and, um, and more modern issues near us? Um, I'll start by saying um, that it's entirely possible that some of those indigenous people are still living on that land and they're just not being recognized. Um, so that, that piece of asking previously inhabited the land, I, I want to say like, they could still very well be there and you just don't see them. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, there are all kinds of apps you can put on your phone now that will show you whose land you're on, like who the tribe is, um, some information about them. I, when Sai takes over for this question, I'll look and see the name of the app I have because I can't remember right now. Um, that's a really good resource just to know whose land you're traveling upon. Um, in terms of more modern issues, follow Native, Native news, you know, follow Indigenous journalists, you know, follow Indigenous writers and filmmakers, you know, we're out there and we're doing things. You know, I didn't mention this in the introduction, but along with running Crushing Colonialism, I am also a journalist. You know, I write, I do photography. I, will, I am the co-creator and co-host of the Decolonized News Hour, which will be launching in 2021. You know, like we're out there, we're doing stuff. Sai is a theater person, you know, so there's so many opportunities to, to hear us and see us and learn from us. Sai, 
Sai, would you like to add some references? I mean, specifically, if you know, things maybe for indigenous folks living in Latin America? Um, there is this Facebook page called Hanan Bata. It's written, it's spelled H A N A N space P A C H A. And if you go down that rabbit hole, which I always recommend if you click on one page and you like that where um, that theme, follow the recommended pages. Um, that's just at the top of my head that I can think of for um, a resource, but it's it's a great page. Um, and so the app that I just mentioned is called Native Land. Um, and someone else also suggested native-land.ca. And so when you're in there, you can you know, find out whose land you're on and learn all about it and then go from there. Um, I think also coming to events like this is a good way to hear from native people, hear the things that we're doing. We have four more days of the three R's. So make sure you register for all of those days. And so with that, we are about to close out. Um, you know, it's been so wonderful getting to do this with you all and appreciating you all um, hanging with us as we work out some technical issues. We believe that access is important. It must be done or organizing work is incomplete. Um, but unfortunately that means you know, sometimes technology fails you. <laughs> so we had to take a little extra time getting ready today. Um, so do we have any more questions? We can take one more. <laughs> okay, all right, I'm gonna assume we don't have any more questions. Um, so yeah, I wanna go ahead and thank again everyone who attended and all of our event volunteers and organizers, um, all of our translators, our captioners. It is a team of people working together to bring you these events. And there is no way that I could have done this all by myself. Um, so I just wanna say thank you to all of them, Wado just thank you in my language. And Wado Desai for bringing in such a valuable voice and experiences um, to this. Sai has also been helping us on the back end with Spanish language coordination. And, and uh, yeah, it's been really great and a learning experience for me too, which is always wonderful. So I also just wanna thank again, our sponsors, the LGBTQ Task Force, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, DC Diverse City Fund, the Campaign for Southern Equality, the Washington Office on Latin America, which I forgot to mention, could also serve as a good resource for learning about indigenous people in Latin America. Um, and then also thank you to the Civil Liberties and Public Policy Conference and program at Amherst College and the North American Indian Center of Boston. <clears throat> so tomorrow, tomorrow's event um, is going to be about the theft of Indigenous children by the colonizer. And so we have two really great panelists with us. We have um, Lakota Elder Madonna Thunderhawk. And then we have um, a youth with us from Colonized Canada, Shayla, Shayla Winter Manitowabi. So you can buy tickets for tomorrow and the rest of the link, uh, rest of the week at the link that we are about to include in the chat box. You must register for every day as every day has a different Zoom webinar link. Um, we have different ticket prices 
as our access costs were pretty high for this event and we always pay our speakers. So if you're somebody who's in a position to pay for a ticket, please do so. However, we will not turn anyone away due to a lack of funds. So if you contact us at crushing colonialism, excuse me, crushing colonialism at gmail.com, we will send you the ticket code to get a free ticket. Um, and we also rely heavily on the support of our community members and allies. And if you're someone who is able to make a donation, please do so. You can make a tax deductible donation on our website. It's crushingcolonialism.org forward slash donate. And that will go through our fiscal sponsor, which is the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. I know it may seem a little odd when their name pops up, but that's our fiscal sponsor. They take in the donations for us and then the money comes to us. Um, so yes, if you are able to show that material solidarity for hashtag Native American Heritage Month, or as we have been calling it since CNN's racist nonsense, uh, hashtag something else Heritage Month, <laughs> um, please do so if you can make that donation. Um, and that is, that's it for today. Uh, join us tomorrow, 6 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be here Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, same day, or excuse me, same time, talking about all kinds of great different aspects of indigeneity with some really amazing people that you probably will not see in one event space uh, anytime soon. So yeah, that's it for today. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other and keep crushing colonialism every single day.